Patrick Egan, what do you teach at New York University? Uh, I'm in the politics department with a courtesy appointment in our uh, public affairs school, uh, the Wagner School. So what classes are you currently teaching? Uh, actually, right now I'm on sabbatical, so uh, it's the professor's uh, joy, um, although we do love our students. Uh, but typically I teach courses in public opinion, uh, and also uh, I actually teach quantitative analysis to our PhD students. What's quantitative analysis? It's uh, the kinds of things that have taken over uh, a lot of uh, how we cover politics in the U.S., uh, namely uh, numerical analysis of politics, so polls, census results, elections, etc. What do you do on a sabbatical? Uh, you write another book. <laughs> At least that's what you hope to do. So uh, that's uh, one of the things I'm working on right now. And here. are you encouraged to publish? At New York University? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it, you know, we're a big uh, R1 research university. Uh, as, as a university, we've really improved our stature over the last, say, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, partly because they've attracted a faculty that's quite devoted to research. And what so book are you that. currently working on? Uh, I'm working on a book about um, how the participation and political attitudes of gay Americans have uh, changed over the course of the last 20 years when we see this huge change in public opinion and Americans uh, and public policy uh, with regard to LGBT folks. So I'm interested in the story uh, that we typically don't hear, which is uh, how are gay people responding to this huge change that has improved their lives so much. So that's uh, at least that's the vision for the next book. What sparked that? Um, I've been doing a lot of research on LGBT politics over the last uh, 10 years. Um, and Ten years ago when I started doing this work in graduate school, there wasn't much data available about what gay people think about politics. Um, uh, and partly because uh, most polls never really asked anybody if they were gay or lesbian. It just wasn't a question that appeared on most political polls. That's changed uh, and we now have actually a lot of data on what uh, gay people, uh, how they vote, uh, what they think about um, all kinds of issues, not just gay rights issues. Um, and one thing that's really interesting that I've seen in some of the work I've already done is that um, gay people are actually staying quite liberal and quite democratic even as uh, you start to see some cracks in the Republican Party's uh, opposition, full-fledged opposition to gay rights. And so one of the instincts I have about where this is going is that you're probably going to continue to see gay people be an important part of the Democratic Party's coalition even as the two parties start to converge a little bit on what they uh, think and say about gay rights. Well, that kind of fits into your current book, the one we invited you here to talk about partisan priorities, how issue ownership drives and distorts American politics. First of all, what is issue ownership? Glad you asked. Uh, so issue ownership is a term that political scientists use uh, that, unlike some other terms, actually, uh, a lay audience will probably understand, which is that the two parties have long-term uh, good reputations uh, associated with particular issues. So if I say to you health care, and I say which party do you think Americans trust to handle health care, you say? Uh, a, I think the majority would probably say Democrat. That's exactly right. I'm not asking for your own opinion, of course, just asking what you think Americans would say. And that's absolutely right. We see that in polls. Uh, taken uh, really consistently over the last 30 years in American politics. Why is that? What is it about health care that Democrats own? That's right. So that's what the book explores, uh, that, that kind of question with regard to a series of issues for both parties. Um, and let me just kind of throw another fact at you and then I can kind of go into the explanation, which is um, in the very same poll, the New York Times actually just did a poll uh, a couple weeks ago where they asked Americans, which party do you think does a better job at handling health care? Sure enough, a majority of the respondents, a majority of Americans, said the Democrats. And then uh, a few minutes later in the poll, Americans were asked, how do you feel about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare? They hate it. <laughs> they can, they've always hated it, and they continue to hate it uh, by a substantial majority. And so one of the interesting paradoxes that I explore in the book is that there are lots of instances where a party owns an issue, uh, and yet it pursues policies that are perceived as too extreme on those issues uh, for the public. Um, and I'm interested in that paradox. Uh, and the answer that I, uh, at which I arrive after a lot of analysis, both historical and quantitative, is that voters um, award ownership to parties 
for the efforts that they undertake on these issues, even if they don't agree with the efforts at all. Uh, so um, we see, and the other thing I should say, is that they reward effort even if they don't necessarily see results. So, for example, a good example here would be crime. Um, the Republicans uh, own crime. That is, if we ask Americans which party do you trust to handle that issue, majority say to the Republicans, and they pretty much say it consistently over the last four decades. Um, that is despite the fact that if you looked at um, how crime rates rise and fall over the uh, presidencies controlled by the two parties, crime has actually fallen significantly farther under Democratic presidents than Republican presidents. Now, I would be the last person to say that's because the Democrats are better at, at crime, uh, because that's actually a very, very difficult question and one that I actually don't really tackle in the book. Uh, but what I do say is that uh, based upon the evidence available to Americans about how objective conditions in the country change when the two parties are in power, there's really no discernible relationship between changes in those conditions on the one hand and which party owns issues on the other. And that, I think, is something a little bit troubling for folks who hope that American democracy can keep the parties accountable uh, on the issues that they allegedly own. So, Patrick Egan, has this led to a further splintering of the American polity, in a sense, because we're all single-issue voters? There's a little bit of that. So, uh, but what I should say is that the issues that I explore in the book are what I call consensus issues. So in the midst of all of this polarization we see in American politics, it can become very easy to forget that every, just about every conservative wants the education system to be good, and just about every liberal wants crime to be low. Even if those two issues fall low on the relative uh, list of priorities of those two groups. And so um, the national consensuses around the goals that have to do with these issues uh, means that, in a sense, um, we aren't quite single-issue voters. That is, just about everybody who walks into a voting booth wants uh, an efficient and low-cost, effective health care system. They might disagree about how to get there, right? And they might disagree about how important a problem it is compared to other problems. But most Americans do agree on that particular goal. And so um, the, the claim I make in the book is that the politics of issue ownership is uh, really um, centered on these uh, consensus issues because uh, parties have every reason to establish good reputations at achieving goals like uh, low-cost health care, low crime rates, uh, a nation safe from its enemies, clean water, right? All of these things that, although they get kind of wrapped up in our uh, polarized politics in contemporary times, uh, most Americans really share uh, consensuses around those goals. Have there been issue ownership changes where the Democrats owned it for a while, now the Republicans own it, or vice versa? Have there been issues like that? Well, one of the, one of the claims I make in the book is that they're pretty uh, rare. Uh, so on most issues, uh, really since the 1970s, uh, they haven't changed hands in any permanent way. Now the parties, and particularly the parties, uh, presidents, and their nominees, will make uh, concerted efforts to uh, steal uh, these issues from the other party, or as we like to say in political science, trespass on these issues. So we can think about Bill Clinton and his crime bill, or we can think about George W. Bush and his uh, education bill, uh, No Child Left Behind. And what I show in the book is that these lead to s significant, but in the end, temporary shifts of ownership uh, between the two parties. Uh, so while No Child Left Behind is being uh, debated and passed in Congress, Republicans enjoy a bit of a resurgence in, their, in the public's estimation of how well they handle the education issue. That goes right back to where it was before about two years later. Um, and the argument make, I make in the book is that part of the reason that the, that's the case is that rank and file Republicans just don't care about education as much as they care about other issues that they believe are more important, like crime, low taxes, the deficit, et cetera. Um, the same thing is true for the Democrats, is in that, uh, you know, Democrats, like everybody, want a low crime rate. But if you ask Democrats which issues are more important, they'll rank things like the environment, poverty, and health care well above uh, fighting crime as a big priority. So because the partisans' uh, priorities, to use the title, the partisans' priorities don't 